So in this video, I'm going to try and answer 10 of the most frequently asked questions my subscribers have asked me about cameras and astrophotography. So let's dive right in. Can I use my DSLR camera or smartphone for astrophotography? Well, this is a basic question I get a lot from people who are thinking about getting into astrophotography for the first time. And the answer to that question is, yes, of course. All you need is a DSLR camera or a smartphone and a tripod so that your camera remains stable while taking long exposure pictures of the night sky. I've used my DSLR and smartphone to take pictures of the Milky Way for instance or to make star trail pictures of the night sky and you can also use your DSLR or smartphone to photograph meteor showers uh, like the Geminids or the Perseids meteor shower. So a second question I get a lot is, should I buy a dedicated astrophotography camera with a telescope? And an answer to that question, or my answer would be, uh, no, not necessarily. It is definitely possible to attach your DSLR camera or smartphone to a telescope using the appropriate adapters. However, there are two main limitations to using a DSLR camera or a smartphone. First of all, your DSLR camera and also your smartphone have what is called an IR cut filter. Now this filter will block the light in the infrared part of the light spectrum, which is great for daytime photography, but unfortunately lots of objects in space like nebulas and galaxies, they emit light in the red and the infrared part of the light spectrum. Now the IR cut filter in your smartphone or camera will block uh, light in the near infrared, so you'll be unable to capture that light from objects in space. Now you can solve this by removing the IR cut filter from your DSLR camera. Now there are often professionals that can remove the IR cut filter for you if you feel uncomfortable doing it yourself. Uh, so you will be able to capture that light in the near infra infrared. Now keep in mind that your daytime pictures will be affected as well. So your pictures will show a reddish glow. The second limitation is that DSLRs and smartphones do not have the options to cool the sensor. So when you take long exposure pictures, the electronics in your camera will heat up and produce noise in your pictures. You may have seen bright red, green and blue dots in your picture when taking a long exposure picture at night, especially when it's hot in the summer. A dedicated astrophotography camera with cooling can cool your camera sensor down and this will improve the quality of your astrophotography pictures. So a third question I get a lot is what kind of astrophotography camera is best suited to capture objects in the night sky? Well, this depends on the object you want to capture. Objects can basically be divided in objects within our own solar system like the planets and our moon and objects outside of our solar system like nebulas or even galaxies beyond our own Milky Way. Now the objects within our solar system receive light from the sun. As such, the planets and our moon are among the brightest objects in the night sky. Now, because they are so bright, you don't need a long exposure time to, to photograph these objects. In fact, most photographers take one to two minute videos of the moon and the planets, after which they process these videos using specific software programs like AutoStackert and Registex, in which they select and stack the highest quality pictures. So when you want to image objects within our own solar system like the planets, you're going to need a camera that is great at taking short videos. I'll get back to mentioning some of the specifications you'll need to take into account when answering the next question. Now objects outside of our solar system like nebulas and other galaxies are many light years away and they receive light from other stars than our sun. As a consequence all of these objects are a lot dimmer and you'll need a camera that is great at taking long exposure pictures of the night sky. Now, as the Earth is rotating, you'll also need a good quality equatorial mount to track these objects in the night sky and a good quality telescope to take good quality pictures of objects in space which are located outside of our solar system. Now, the process of deep sky astrophotography is very different from planetary imaging. You're actually going to take many pictures of the same object in space, which you'll stack together using specific software programs like Deep Sky Stacker, Photoshop or PixInsight. So as a follow up to the third question, a fourth question is then, what cameras are best suited for imaging the moon and the planets? I get these questions a lot. 
Now when capturing the planets, one of the most important things to look for is if the camera has a high frame rate per second or a high FPS. Now, the higher the number of frames per second the camera has, the more pictures you'll have of the planets for each of your videos within a given time. Now, if your camera has a frame rate per second of 25, you'll end up with 25 times 60 is 1500 pictures of a planet in a one minute video. When your camera has an FPS of 50, you'll end up with 50 times 60 is 3000 pictures of that same planet uh, within the, the same amount of time. Now, the more pictures or frames you'll be able to collect in a video, the more options you'll have to select high quality pictures of a planet and disregard the low quality pictures. Moreover, as the planets are among the tiniest objects in the sky, you don't need a high resolution camera. Often a 1 or 2 megapixel camera is already sufficient to capture the planets in our solar system. Now, One exception is the moon, which is of course a lot bigger than the planets. So you'll need a higher resolution camera for the moon, also depending on the focal length of your telescope or lens you're using. Now for planets, I would recommend a focal length of at least 2000 millimeters on your telescope, whereas for the moon, about 300 millimeters of focal length is already sufficient to get a good view of the craters, maris and mountain ranges of the moon. So what cameras are best suited for deep sky astrophotography? Well, Deep sky objects like galaxies, nebulas and globular clusters, they come in different shapes and sizes. Also they are a lot dimmer as compared to solar system objects. So you'll need a camera that is excellent at taking long exposure pictures to catch the dim light from deep space objects. The first thing you want to look at is if the camera uh, has the option to cool the camera sensor down to at least minus 10 degrees Celsius or about 14 degrees Fahrenheit. By cooling down the camera sensor, you'll end up with a much cleaner picture of the deep sky object without the noise otherwise produced by the camera sensor. Also, you want to check if the quantum efficiency or QE uh, of the camera is high. The higher the, your quantum efficiency is, the better your camera is able to convert photons from deep space into an electronic signal that will be registered by your camera sensor. Another thing you might want to look into is the dynamic range of the camera, often indicated by the analog to digital converter or ADC measured in bits. And also you want to check the full well capacity measured in electrons. The higher the ADC number and the full well depth numbers of your camera are, the higher the dynamic range of your camera. The higher the dynamic range is, the more tonal variations the camera can show between the black and white points of your pictures. So a sixth question I also get a lot is, how do I know if deep sky objects will fit on my pictures? Well, this depends on four variables, being the size of the object you want to image, often measured in degrees and arc minutes, uh, the focal length of your telescope, often measured in millimeters, and the resolution of your camera measured in the number of pixels in width and height and also the pixel size of your camera sensor. Now one good way to check if the object will fit in your picture is to use free software tools like Stellarium. In Stellarium you can simply add information about the telescope and camera you're going to use and Stellarium will show you a square or a rectangle that is synonymous with the field of view you will be getting when imaging an object in the night sky. So a seventh question I get a lot from you guys is, should I buy a mono or a color astrophotography camera? And the answer to that question is that it really depends. If you're just starting out, I always recommend buying a color camera. It makes the whole process of capturing and processing your astro pictures a lot easier. Now this being said, you can get higher quality pictures when using a mono camera with additional filters. The main difference between a mono and a color camera is that a mono camera doesn't have what is called a Bayer matrix, while a color camera does have a Bayer matrix. Now a Bayer matrix is a matrix of tiny filters with a so-called RGG bean or red, green, green, blue pattern. So this basically means that 25% of your camera sensor is able to collect red or blue light, while 50% of your camera sensor is able to collect green light when using a color camera. And this is actually great for daytime photography. Unfortunately, many objects in space, like nebulae, are primarily emitting light in the red and blue parts of the visible light spectrum. 
Now by using a mono camera in combination with separate red or blue filters, your camera will be able to collect most of the photons in that part of the light spectrum, also depending on the quantum efficiency of your camera to turn photons into electrons. However, you do need to spend much more time on capturing and processing an object as you're capturing objects using separate red, green and blue filters. So the eighth question I get a lot is, can I get into astrophotography when I live in a city under severely light polluted skies? Well, the answer to that question is yes, definitely. Now, of course, a dark sky location without light pollution is still the best way to get the highest quality pictures. And you can actually use apps like Dark Sky Finder to search for dark sky locations in your neighborhood. However, lots of us don't have the, the, don't have the option or the time to move to a dark sky location for every imaging session. Luckily, there are ways to capture deep sky objects under light polluted skies. Your first option is to buy what is called a light pollution filter for your DSLR or astrophotography camera. Now, light pollution filters are able to block the light in the visible part of the light spectrum that often come from artificial light sources like high and low pressure sodium lights, often used in street lights and industrial areas. There is one issue and that is that LED lights are becoming more and more popular in most cities. LED lights are very efficient, which is of course good for power consumption, uh, but LED lights emit light in all parts of the visible light spectrum. And that makes it harder to block LED light with a light pollution filter. Now, a second way to get into astrophotography from a light polluted uh, sky is to engage in so-called narrowband imaging. Now, when using narrowband filters, you are able to capture a very small portion of the visible light spectrum that coincides with the emission of light from specific elements that are often present in deep sky objects, like hydrogen and oxygen, which are among the most often found elements in the universe. Now, you can integrate pictures taken with various narrowband filters to create a color picture, where the colors actually represent the elements that are present within a deep sky object. So a ninth question I get a lot from you guys is how sky conditions other than light pollution can affect the quality of your images. Now, a lot of people then talk about astronomical seeing and astronomical seeing, it relates to outside conditions. So think about humidity, the temperature outside, uh, whether or not there are high jet streams uh, and bad cloud layers. And also think about wind, all of which can severely affect the quality of your astrophotography pictures. Now, also when objects are closer to the horizon, there is a lot more atmosphere you have to photograph through actually as compared to capturing objects that are directly overhead in the zenith. And all of these things, they can negatively affect the quality of your pictures. Now there are various applications and uh, websites that can show you how all of these elements affect your astronomical seeing. So the 10th and final question I will attempt to answer for you is, what is the best camera and telescope combination to photograph objects in the night sky? Now, this is a little bit tricky to answer, but for deep sky astrophotography, it is indeed important uh, to check out if your camera is a good match with your telescope. Now, there are many things to take into account, uh, but one of the most important things you need to do is to check your imaging skill. Now, any kind of telescope and camera combination will give us the arc seconds per pixel. Now, the formula is actually pixel size of the camera divided by the focal length of your telescope times 206.3. And this will give you the angular resolution in arc seconds per pixel. Now, most of us, uh, we shoot from skies that have sky conditions or seeing conditions between one and two arc seconds. Now this means that objects in space that are smaller than one arc second, they will be blurred to a size of one arc second uh, by the atmosphere. Now if you choose a camera telescope combination that gives you less than one arc second per pixel, uh, for instance, if you're using a very uh, long focal length telescope, stars will cover many pixels and appear large or bloated. And this is because you are spreading out the light from the star over many pixels. Uh, and the sensitivity of your imaging will decrease because of that. 
Now, when you're using a camera and telescope combination with an arc second per pixel that is actually higher than two, uh, most of the light from a single star will fall on a single pixel. Now, this is actually called undersampling. And with undersampling, the image of the star can appear blocky uh, as not enough pixels are used to convey a round shape of a star. Now, there's also an exception to that rule of getting um, a telescope camera combination of about one arc second per pixel. And that exception is when you're going to engage in planetary imaging. When making short videos of the planets using a high frame rate per second, it is actually possible to beat the astronomical seeing, as it is called. There may be a window during your imaging session when the seeing drops below the average of one to two arc seconds. And if that is the case, uh, yeah, pictures below one arc second per pixel will provide sharp images of the planets you're trying to capture. So there you have it, the 10 most often asked questions you guys ask me about cameras that are suited to photograph objects in the night sky. I hope this video is some, of some value to you. If it is, please consider to give this video a thumbs up and please consider subscribing to the channel if you like astrophotography and astronomy in general. I hope to see you again in one of my other videos and until that time, of course, I want to wish you a happy 2022 and clear skies.